and we're back. Uh, happy Thursday. Today we'll continue on with our discussion of processes, but before we begin, we'll get first to some administrative bits. The reading by the 6th of October, uh, pages 106 through 145 in the Operating Systems Concepts book, and of course, Project 1 on palindromes is due 29th of this month, September, at the usual 11.59 and 59 seconds. And so, when we last left off, we talked about this idea of context switching, and that was the saving away of process state uh, in order to load the CPU with the state of a different process when execution switches from one process to the next. And this context switch, we said, takes time. And therefore, in an operating system, we want to have this context switch as fast as possible, and we also want to make sure that we're not switching too much, introducing additional overhead when useful work is not getting done. And context of a process is stored in a data structure uh, called the process control block or PCB. So let's exit here and pause before we continue on and go to Ubuntu Linux and talk about structures in C, which are so-called user-defined types. So I will meet you in Ubuntu uh, on virtual machine, virtual box. Okay, so here we are in virtual box and we're in our project directory where we left off last time. And we have a file called demo.c and a make file that's going to compile and link demo.c for us. And so let's create a new file from the existing one. So we're gonna copy demo.c and we're gonna copy it to a file uh, called struct. Let's call it, no, not struct, let's call it demo1.c. Okay, and so demo1.c, if we take a look at it, it has all of the contents of demo, but let's remove this malloc and let's remove the guts of all of this. And we're going to just use the header files, and that's all we're going to do. Okay, so now we have demo one, and that's a different pro program from demo. So let's modify the make file, and we're going to add to this make file to also compile and link demo one. So here we have demo and the other dependency on the default target or default rule is demo. One, that's going to be a result of compiling demo one. So now we have all of these rules. And we're going to change the clean rule because when we clean, we want to delete demo, demo.o. We're also going to remove demo one and demo one dot o, the object files and the executables. So likewise, we're going to have our target demo one depends on demo one dot o. And the rule for that is going to be to compile GCC, rather to link GCC dash O, demo one, demo one dot O. All right. So then we have the other dependency, demo one dot O, is going to depend on demo one dot C. And the action for that is to compile GCC, compile demo one dot C. All right. So that's our rule, and if we look at this, clear, let's run this make file, let's run make, and we see that we get for demo1.c. So if I make clean, we remove all of our generated files. If I make again, we'll see the compile and link happen both for demo as well as demo1. And so if I do a long listing, ls-l, I see I have two executables in green, demo and demo1. If I type demo and load it, there's my demo from before. Let me clear, demo one, demo one. If I run that, well, it's just that small stuff. So let's look inside of demo one dot C. And what we're gonna concentrate now is on something called a user defined type. And so let me add in a comment here. And this comment is just, for our sake to kind of look at what we're doing in this file. Here, we demonstrate 
see structures which are a user defined type. And a user defined type, or UDT, is an element that looks like it's part of the language, but it's something that you define. And so what we're going to do, we're going to have a keyword struct for C structure, and a structure uh, is an aggregation of a bunch of different data types together. And so let's assume that we have uh, an, an application where we have a, a banking application or, or, or student accounts or something like this. And we're going to have for each record, we're going to have a first name, we're going to have a last name, we're going to have an ID number, and we're going to have a balance. And so the structure, let's call it record type. And that record type is a block. And the name, close here, is going to be a character. So we said it's going to be a first name. So we're going to say char first name. And that's going to have some number of characters. We're going to have char, an array, last name. And that's going to have some number of characters. So let's add in a preprocessor directive to give us the maximum size of our strings. Number sign define name length and let's say 256 characters. So our first name is going to be an array of characters and it's going to be name length many characters or 256 characters. Likewise, our last name is going to be name, length, many characters. Now here, when we define these arrays, we're not dynamically allocating them. We're statically allocating them. And therefore, these two character arrays, the space for them is going to be in the data section of the process. Had I created them with malloc, they would be in the heap because they would be dynamically allocated. So I'm statically allocating them when I have this definition, and these are each 256 characters in length. So let's say you have your ID, uh, and we're going to make that an integer ID. And then lastly, we're going to include a balance, float balance. And so all of these types collected together are associated with this name called record type. Now, this looks a lot like a class file, class definition. In Java, a class has two things. It has instance variables of different types, and it has methods. Now, a struct, imagine if you were building something, a data structure that looks like a class, only it does not have methods. It only has data types. And that's exactly what a struct does. It allows you to create a user-defined type and give it a name, record type. And now you can use that name to refer to some entity that has four fields in it, first name, last name, ID, and a balance, which are types of character arrays for first name and last name, and ID is integer, and balance is a floating point. So now, if we were going to use this, user-defined type in a practical application, well, all we have to do is just use that type, struct, record, type, rec. And now, of course, if I have that record type, rec, just for good measure, I'm going to mem set, starting at the address of rec, set to all zeros to zero everything out, size of record, Type. So for good measure, I'm initializing this record type to all zeros. And so I like to put all of my defined data that are local to a function. I like to put them right at the top. You can put them anywhere, certainly. But this just seems a little bit neater to me uh, to do that. So now I've set it to zero. And let me go ahead and fill it with data. Okay. So I'm going to say, sprintf, 
So it does exactly what I remember it does. So now we're going to take our record and we're going to fill in the fields for first name, last name, ID, and balance using sprintf system call. And so sprintf takes two parameters and it's var arg, and it says, all right, well, if you give me a format and you give me a location and you give me the data, I am going to write that data in the format in the location in the character array or character string that you've given me. So if I say S printf has three parameters, I want the target of this S printf to be the record, that first name field. Now that first name, if I just refer to the variable for the array, that's the same as a pointer uh, to a string or pointer to a car. That's going to be the target, and I want to send to it percent %s, that means a string, and then the text I'm going to give it is going to be, say, John. Okay, so now I did that for the first name. I'm going to copy that, and you look at last name field in that C structure, and I'm going to say Smith as the string I'm going to write in there. Okay, so now I'm going to take that ID and refer to ID. And let's say the ID is uh, five, for example. And then the balance for that data structure, rec, it's going to be rec.balance. And I'm going to set that balance equal to maybe it's $27, for example. All right, so now I save this, and I can now print out all of the contents of my data structure. So I'll say first name, percent S, that's going to be the first name, and the data I'm going to use is going to be rec first, first name. And then I'm going to print last from that last name. Just for sent s, it's going to be rec last name. And then I'm going to print out the ID. And that ID is going to be a decimal, and it's going to be rec ID. And then lastly, I'm going to print out the balance. And balance is going to be floating point number format percent F. And I'm going to use that balance field from my structure. Okay, so now that I've done that, I take my struct, I populate its fields with a value for that statically allocated instance uh, held by variable referred to by rec. So rec for record is of type struct record type. It's a structure and I'm static initialize one of them as a local variable and then I set those values. So let's take a look at this. So let me make forgot size of size of struct record type. Okay. Let me make oops, forgot the spelling. Okay. Last name. All right, let me save. Make. There we go. So now if I, if I say run demo one, we see John Smith, balance 27, test program demonstrating C code. All right, so let's modify this. And 
instead of saying demonstrating C code, we're going to say demonstrating C structures. And I've just done static initialization. So let me change this one. Static initialization here. And then now I'm going to do dynamic allocation. That should be static allocation. So let me change that title. Dynamic allocation here. Static allocation here. All right, so, and you'll notice I save and then I recompile, fix errors, and then continue, develop incrementally. Static allocation here. Okay, so I save that. I call make, I remake it. I run demo one. And show that everything's up to par. So now let's go back to demo one dot C. And now we're going to do dynamic allocation. Now, certainly, it's a little bit tedious to have to say struct every time you want to define the type. So there's another keyword you can add. Type def struct, you give it a keyword. And I like to use underscore here and use the actual type name that I'm going to employ when I program with it down as this next to this semicolon record type and so this record type now I can use as a type like integer is a type like string is a type or char is a type I can use that whenever I go to create a variable so now instead of saying struct each time I just say record struct type right instead of saying size of record struct record type I just say record type and so this type def allows me to manipulate things but not get too wordy every time I wanted to find a structure. So let me save that. Let me make, let me run my demo. And you see that, yeah, it's fine. So let's go back into demo and let's look at dynamic allocation. Now suppose I wanted not just one record type, but what if I wanted a bunch of record types? So I'm going to remove this val putter, and I'm going to write record type star record pointer. And I'm going to set that equal to null. And so now we have a new variable, rec pointer, and that's going to be a pointer, and it's going to store the address of some memory. And in that memory, where that record pointer has an address for, it's going to format the data, that memory, as a record type. And where record type has a character of 256 characters long, character array, followed by another character array, 256 bytes long, or characters long, an ID, which is an integer, and then the floating point balance. And so now, when I come down below, if I'm going to do dynamic allocation, let's assume I wanted some number of records just to make things a little bit easier for us. Let's going to say define, sign define, num records, and let's say we have three records. Not too many, but enough to demonstrate our point. So now we're going to allocate 
numrex many records. In fact, I didn't need that semicolon because that's a preprocessor command. So now I'm going to say rec pointer is equal to malloc size of record type times num rex. And because malloc returns a void star, we want to use a casting operator. And so this casting operator, I'm going to say cast it to be a record type star. And I'm telling C to say, OK, well, assume that the memory return, the block of memory return as a result of malloc allocation is going to be formatted as three record types. So I want that much space, enough to store three of them. And so now, for good measure, I'm going to initialize them all to zeros. Mem set rec pointer set to zeros size of record type times num rex num rex. Okay. So initialize a block of memory starting at address rec pointer to zeros. And I'm going to do it for record type size times num rex. Okay. So now what I can do is I can use rec pointer to refer to those records in the first position, second position, and third position. So one thing I can do is I can use rec pointer as if it were an array. I can say rec pointer. The zeroth one, the first one, the second one, and then I can say dot the field name. One thing I can also do is as a pointer, if I said rec pointer plus plus, what it increments when I say plus plus, now typically in programming, plus plus means the variable equals variable plus one. But what it does in C when you increment the pointer is that it adds enough bytes or enough to that value, that address, to account for that particular size of the data structure. So if you have a data structure, uh, a struct, and you have a pointer to struct, and that struct has 256 elements in it, and it's 256 bytes long, rec plus plus, record pointer plus plus is going to add or result in 256 being added to that address because you need those 256 bytes in order to get to the location of memory of the next thing. And so this idea of plus plus, when we talk about plus plus for a pointer, that is incrementing or similar to incrementing the array to the next position of the array, the next location for that next structure's worth of data. So I'm going to take my rec pointer. And because it's a pointer, there's a different notation for accessing the record referred to by that pointer, and that's called the arrow notation. So if I say rec pointer first name, well, that's going to be the first field, that character array for the first name. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do my S printf, but I'm going to use the record pointer to do that for each one of these three records. So if I say S printf, store and record pointer first name. I'm going to store a string, percent %s, and the particular string I'm going to store is Mary is the first name. Okay, so I do that. Let me do similarly an operation for last name. Last name. And last name for Mary is going to be Jones. Jones. Mary Jones. Okay. So now I have Mary Jones. And now the ID, rec pointer, field, the ID field, ID is equal to 1. And then rec pointer. balance is 
was equal to, and let's say the balance were equal to, let's say $27. All right. So now I'm going to do this for the next record. So what do I do? I increment rec pointer plus plus, and it now points to the next thing. And so I do this all over again. And let me just copy here just for the sake or interest of time. So I'm going to copy this. Let me uh, edit, copy. See, what are my hotkeys? Control Shift C, Control Shift V. Okay. So I increment my record pointer and Control Shift V. There we go. So I increment my record pointer and now. I'm pointing rec pointer after I say rec pointer plus plus and point I store the address of the next location in memory where I have a struct record type. And so now I'm going to say, let's see, Sarah Johnson. And Sarah's ID, let's say her ID is 15. ID number 15 and let's say Sarah oops I didn't mean to do that Sarah's ID number is 15 and her balance is let's say $103 okay so now I'm at the second record so let me say rec pointer plus plus and let me control Shift B, and when I say record pointer plus plus another time, I'm now referring to that block of memory that that stores the third item in the array, the third record type. So let's say Paul, and last name is Peterson. And Paul's ID is, say, 7. And Paul has a balance of uh, $68. Okay. So now that I've done this, let's go ahead and loop and print these out. 4, int i, equals 0, i, less than num rex, i, plus plus. Open curly brace, close curly brace, define the block. And now we're going to do our printing out. So I'm going to reuse my printouts, but now I'm going to print using this arrow notation because I'm dealing with a pointer and no longer a static initialization. So control shift C for copy. And I'm going to go down here inside the four, control shift V for paste. And let me respect the indentation. Now, C doesn't care if it's indented, unlike Python, but it just looks nice. So I like to put a standard number of spaces to represent margins for indentation. It allows you to more easily see the beginning and end of the block of behavior. So, first name is going to be rec. Instead of dot notation, we use arrow notation. First name. Let's try that again. Rec. Insert. First name. And that's rec. Last name. And rec. ID and that's rec balance. All right. And so let's have another printout that says print up record record percent D. 
backslash n. Let's see. Let's do another one. Backslash n. And then we're going to say i plus 1. And I say i plus 1 because i begins with 0. I don't want to say record 0. I'd like to say record 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. And so now we're going to print the record label. And we're going to print all the fields in the record after populating these three many records. So now that I've done that, well, I come to the end of the block and I want a free rec pointer. But rec pointer is now different from the beginning of the memory location. I want to make sure I rewind, as it were, to the beginning. So instead of just saying rec pointer, I'm going to define a second one, record type star record cursor. And a cursor is just what I'm going to use whenever I want to iterate through something, go from one thing in this list, access through a pointer to the next. And so I set my rec pointer based on the malloc, and I mem set from that address beginning at rec pointer. All right, and so the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna initialize my cursor. I'm gonna say cursor, rec cursor more correctly, is equal to rec pointer. So now I'm gonna use cursor, and the reason why I do that is because I wanna hold on to the beginning of that block of memory uh, that I dynamically allocate. So that's why I use cursor, and when I say plus plus, I say cursor plus plus. So rec cursor, we have rec cursor here, and then we have rec cursor plus plus. Rec cursor. Rec cursor, and then we also say rec cursor plus plus here. And so we have cursor separate from rec pointer, because the problem is when you say rec pointer plus plus, you're no longer referring to the beginning of the block of memory. So when you come down here and you're going to free that, you want to free it from the beginning of the block, not the end of the block. And you're at the end of the block when you say rec cursor plus plus, pointing to the third instance of a record type in memory. And so here, again, we have rec pointer. So let me call it rec cursor. And here, rec pointer. Let me call it rec cursor. Arrow notation for dereference. And then lastly, rec cursor. Rec cursor. Okay, so I have my cursor, and now when I go through my records, well, I want to set my pointer in addition to my index. So i is equal to zero, and I'm going to say cursor is equal to rec pointer. And so I set my cursor back to the beginning, the rec pointer, and then I iterate using rec cursor. And instead of I plus plus, rec cursor here, I have rec cursor, and I have rec ID, rec, rec cursor ID, and I have rec cursor balance. So now, when I say I++, plus plus, I also say rec cursor plus plus. Okay. So let's save that and let's make it and see what happens. So I run make.
line 11, 47. Let's see. Let's see what we have. Record type. Record type. So let's see. Record pointer. Ah, that's why. I have the equal sign in the wrong place. So that malloc, I used the cast operator. I said cast then equals. That's not correct. So let me clear. Let's see. Line 71. See what the error message was. Okay. So it doesn't like that without the cast operator. So we can certainly do that. Rec pointer. Cursor. So here, rec pointer. Cursor equals pointer, and then here, rec cursor equals rec pointer. Okay, so let me record type star. Okay, so we cast there, and let's take a look. That's a warning. So let's see, right cursor, first name, 74. 74. Rec cursor equals rec pointer. Rec cursor, let's see, 71. S. First name. Sent L. Sent D. Let's look at the error message again. Right cursor. Okay. Cursor. Right. Cursor. Record type star. Cursor. All right, rec pointer cast as record type star just for good measure, and then we will clear make Let's see line seventy four. Column 35, invalid type of argument of arrow, have int. So let's take a look. 74, line 35, so column 35. 74, column 35. All right, so right cursor. There we go. Right cursor equals right pointer. Int i equals zero. Let's see if that works. The number X, just let's start that. Let's see. Initialization and I. All 
All right, so let's initialize rec cursor. Cursor equals rec pointer. Let me put that in here. Put that up there. So we do the initialization, and we're just going to use the i inside the for loop to do our iteration. Int i i equals zero i less than num records i plus plus and rec cursor plus plus all right so we're going to iterate and we're going to print what we populated so let's type make and let's see what happens so there's demo demo one and when we look at demo one we see static allocation here okay then we have record one, Mary Jones, ID 15, balance 103, Sarah Jones, Johnson, ID 0, balance 0, Paul Peterson, 7, and 68. So let's go back and see what happened to Sarah. So if we look at Sarah Johnson, so we said rec cursor plus plus, first name Sarah, rec pointer, ah, should be rec cursor. because I rec pointer is at the first record and not this last record. So it's doing exactly what we wanted it to do. So we say rec cursor arrow and we say rec cursor cursor arrow. All right, so let's try it again. So we make clear run demo and there we go, Sarah Johnson, 15103, Paul Peterson, Mary Jones, and there we are. And so this is an example of C structs, which are user-defined type, and they're used to aggregate a bunch of different data types together under a single type name that you can then use in your program. And we've demonstrated both the static initialization and populating of the data structure, as well as the dynamic allocation and populating of the data structure. So let's go back into PowerPoint. Now meet you in PowerPoint. Okay, we're back in PowerPoint and let's quickly go through what we had to say about process scheduling. Operations on processes, rather, um, have, you have to provide mechanisms to create processes, terminate processes, uh, and so on, as we detail in the fall. And so when you create a process, a process invokes a system call that is used to create so-called child processes. And these child processes can in turn create other processes. They're their children. And so you get a tree, sort of like an ancestry tree uh, of all the processes. And each process is managed uh, by the so-called process identifier, or PID, or process ID. And you can have parent-child processes share resources. Uh, a child can share a subset of parent resources, or the parent-child can be completely decoupled in their resources and share no resources. And there are different types of options that you can have in terms of the execution of a parent and his children. You can have a parent and child execute at the same time concurrently, or the parent waits for the child to terminate before the parent resumes its execution. And so this is the tree of processes in Linuxes. There's the init process whose job is to start all the things in your system, like the login process, the threading process, of uh, the secure shell for remote logging. Then there are other things like bash, the born again shell, which are child processes of your login process, uh, PS post, uh, for listing your processes, and Emacs, uh, which is a text editor. And these are invoked as child processes of your command line interface shell. And so your command line interface, when you type the name of a command and hit enter, it is creating a pro child process and, that ch and then loading in that child process the program in question. And so this is the tree of processes in Linux, and this organization is very useful. Now, in terms of the address space, a child starts out as an exact duplicate of the parent. And then after that, the child's duplicate is loaded with the new program off disk, and that becomes the new process. And so in Unix, how you duplicate a parent, that's called the fork system call, that creates a new process, child process, and exec is loading a new program to overwrite that duplicate of the parent that called fork. And so this is a schematic, it's in the book, 
here we have the fork and the parent then runs as well as the new child which is an exact copy of this juncture after the fork system call it's an exact copy of the parent process and so let me select my pen pen color it's like blue and at this juncture in time both the parent and the child processes are exact copies and they're both running the child copy calls this exec routine and that exec function system call it loads a new program into that copy that clone if you will and the parent process sits and it waits to see how the child exits so the child exits the exit status that tells what happened to this child process is given to the parent that's waiting and the parent that's waiting gets it and continues on with the execution and so here's an example in c using uh, the POSIX interface. We have our number sign includes, which are the libraries that we're going to use for system calls. We have our main, and this is our main block. We have an open and closed curly brace. So if we were to look at this, this is our main block, and we could literally draw a rectangle around it to define that behavior for that main routine. And so we're going to include a structure, and that's why I covered structures in C. Uh, there are special structures defined by the Linux kernel uh, that are for lots of internal bookkeeping types of things. So a PID underscore T, uh, somewhere in the Linux header files, there's a type def, and it's a PID underscore T, and it's the data structure, C struct, that contains all the pieces of information needed to describe a process. And so we create one of these structs, uh, static allocation call it accessible through variable PID. And then we fork the child process. So we call the fork system call. And when this fork returns, it's gonna return in two different programs. One copy is the parent and one is the child. So as a result of fork, we get a PID. And now the parent copy of this PID, provided that there's no error. So here in this block, we do error checking to see if that fork failed. Now, why would a fork fail? Because your operating system no longer has sufficient resources in order to duplicate the pro process that called this fork system call. Now, assuming that there's no error, then there are two copies of that process that are now running at this juncture, at just after this if block. And one copy has this PID equals zero. That's going to be the child process. And the other has that PID greater than zero. That's going to be the parent process. And so the child process, it executes here, and it's an exact copy of everything in the parent, and then the parent process, it executes here. Now, the first thing that child process does, it's an exact copy, it calls this exact LP, which loads that bin LS, that listing program, overriding the entire contents of the child's copy of this process. And now it's running that LS. Likewise, the parent, which is running uh, concurrently, it waits for the exit of that child. Once it gets the child's exit status, which in this case, after LS terminates, it then says complete, the child is complete, prints that out. And then the parent process exits where you see this return at the end of the main function block. So this is literally the source code. You could copy and paste this and compile it and run it. That's the source code uh, for forking a separate process, a child process. This is uh, the same API or similar function in Windows, and Windows is a little bit different. Here, if you look at the forking, right, that is done by create process instead of fork, and it also gives you, as one of the parameters, uh, the command line for the function to call. And so in Windows, you have this explicit both forking create process as well as which program to load in that clone, as it were. And so once that is successful, we wait for single object, that's now where the parent runs in order to call child complete once it gets the exit status of that child process. Okay. So it's a little bit different in Windows, but when you terminate a process, the process has executed its last statement and then it signals or tells the operating system to go ahead and delete me because I'm done and that's the exit system call. And the parent process waits for the child process to end. And what happens is the return status is some actual data that connotes whether the child process ran successfully or didn't, that return status is given back to the parent that must 
and it does so through this wait system call. So when a parent process calls wait, it's saying, operating system, give me the return status of this child process that I created. And then lastly, all the processes resources are deallocated by the operating system once this exit has been completed. So the parent can also not just wait for a child to exit, it can also abruptly terminate uh, a child's process that's running. And this is accomplished through the abort system call. Now, there are some validly good, perfectly good reasons for doing this. Maybe a child process has exceeded its allocation of resources. Uh, it's no longer assigned a particular subtask or task, or the parent is exiting, and it says, oh, the child is not allowed to run on the system if the parent itself is also exiting. And so some operating systems do not allow a child to exist unless if its parent doesn't exist. And so we talked about that tree depicting the parent-child uh, relationships. If a child creates a child, creates another child, and that child creates a child, you get this tree structure uh, describing the parent-child process relationships. Now, in some operating system, if you are a child, you're not allowed to run on the operating system if your parent process has terminated. And that's called cascading termination. And you can imagine that as propagating this exit or abort uh, down through the tree. If a parent is going to terminate, one of the things it does is it calls abort on all of its children before it terminates. And so that cascading termination is done by literally propagating these abort calls through the parent's tree in an operating system. And so when you fork, you have separate processes. And again, in that one of those copies of the process, you can run another program. And it's really important not to forget this exec here. That exec is what loads the new program overwriting that parent copied, that clone or copy of the parent process. And so when we talked about termination, we saw that the parent process, the parent part of the process, it calls wait system call. And that wait system call waits for the child to complete. It literally, if you give it a pointer listing an address, it will store for you when the child process returns, it will store the exit status of that child. And so here, if we did not specify null, that means the parent, if it's null, is not interested in the exit status of the child, but it still calls wait. But if we wanted to maintain and receive that exit status, to know what happened with the child process, we would give it the address of some variable where we want that information to be stored when the child exits. If no parent process is waiting, that's called a zombie process. It's really important to have a parent waiting for a child process. If a parent is terminated, if a parent terminates without invoking wait, then that process is called an orphan. And so certainly in the nomenclature, there's a lot of kind of familial types of relationships that they use uh, to make it all manageable to ascribe names to things. And so multi-process architectures are really important. Why? Because processes run and they fail on their own. And so oftentimes when you want to structure a computation and you don't want the whole application to crash because parts of it crash, you structure that computation so that one part of your application is handled by different processes. And so one example is a web browser. Now, in the early days, a web browser was run as a single process, and some still do. And if you have multiple websites that you're open to in different tabs, if one website crashed, well, the entire browser would crash and just exit or hang. And so Google Chrome browser is multi-process, and it has three different types of processes. You have the browser process that manages the user interface and the disk and interaction with network I.O. You have the renderer, which is responsible for drawing things on your screen. Uh, and then you have the plugin process uh, that is responsible for interacting with the extensions that you can have for your browser. Now, in this architecture, when you have one that takes a long time or is slow, maybe you're waiting for I.O. when you're interacting with the disk or the network, network um, I.O. device, well, why should the whole browser pause? We talked about the scheduler. Taking it off the ready, or taking it uh, off the CPU, and it sits in the device queue. Well, now you can select with a short-term scheduler a new process that might be the process that's drawing things from the web page to the screen. So you're always making progress by dividing things up uh, as multiple processes in addition. And so the plug.
plugins, well, if you're extending the browser, it's very likely something might crash. You don't want it to bring down your whole browser. And so let's take a look at inter-process communication. Now, certainly, when you have processes that receive or are performing some subset of the work, well, sometimes you want to collect the results of that work in some application. So that means processes uh, may need to cooperate. And cooperating processes are those which can be affected by the progress of other processes. And this includes things like shared data or some result from a task is complete. And so the reasons for processes cooperating include things like information sharing, uh, maybe to, to chop up a big problem into small pieces, and that gives you speed, sped up computation, modularity, or maybe just simple uh, convenience. And a cooperating process needs this way to communicate, and the mechanism is called inter-process communication, or IPC. Now, there are two major flavors for IPC. One is to use shared memory. So you're going to store information shared between processes in RAM. So that's going to be your quote-unquote channel of communication. And the other is message pa uh, passing. And so with message passing, you have a queue, and this queue is kept somewhere in your system. Could be sometimes in memory, sometimes in the kernel. And this queue is allocated. And like any queue, it's first in, first out. You deposit your messages into the queue through specialized API calls, and then messages are consumed on the other end of the queue from the tail of the queue. So you insert at the head, you remove from the tail. Now with shared memory, well, it's just as the name implies. It's a piece of memory that is accessible by two different processes. And so in this particular case, and this is from the book, we have two processes, process A and process B, and then we allocate a piece of shared memory. And let's say A is going to write to that shared memory, and B is going to read from that shared memory. And in doing so, you can transfer data between two processes that need to coordinate. And in fact, a very popular approach for image processing pipelines is to keep your images in shared memory, and each process that operates on it performs some transformation on that image to give you all sorts of special effects. Cooperating processes that are independent can't be altered or affect one another, and a cooperating process can affect another process because they're relying on partial results or data from one another. And so when you cooperate, you get a lot of benefits, including speed up. One example of coordination is the so-called producer-consumer problem. Now, this is a paradigm for cooperating processes, and the producer um, produces the information, deposits it in that shared memory or that message queue, and then the consumer is the one that takes those pieces of information. So you're producing something and someone else takes it or consumes it. And so there are two different types of producer-consumer problems. One assumes unbounded buffer. That means there's no limit placed on the size of the queue or the buffer in which these pieces of information are deposited. And then you also have the converse of that, that's bounded buffers, and that assumes that there is a finite buffer size, a fixed size, and the buffer can fill up. So in bounded buffer shared memory solution, you have your cooperation, your IPC mechanism has a bound on it, it's a buffer, and it's using shared memory. So you have some piece of data, and that data might be a C structure, and your buffer has some size. So in this particular case, in the first line, uh, we define our struct, type def struct, and there is our user defined type, and we're going to use that name as a type in the language in C. And so our buffer size, it's a preprocessor uh, uh, statement, a buffer size of 10. And so we do a static allocation of our buffer using 10 of these, an array of 10 of these structures called item. And so you have these cursors, these numbers, these integers representing offsets, and in is where the next data item is going to be added, and out is where the next data item is going to be read out or consumed. And so this solution is correct, but you can only use buffer size many elements. So what do you do? Well, you produce the next item and then continue in a tight loop, continuing to grab the items off the list. So what do we have? You produce an item, and then you look at where in is, in is initialized, and that's going to start out as zero. And you increment, so you input in the zero position, increment to the next one, to the next one. And then when you reach the end of the buffer size, you do nothing.
because if you reach the end of the buffer size, right, and if that's equal to the, where you're going to take things out, you don't want to keep writing over things that you haven't yet taken out. So you have your in and your out values. They both start out as zero, and in is going to grow. Now, you'll notice here you have this modulo buffer size statement, and that modulo buffer size statement says whenever you reach the end of the buffer, the next thing it wants to do is wrap back around to zero again. But it'll only allow you to add that newly produced item in the next location, a circular location, including wraparound, if you're not currently at the location for where the next item is going to be taken out. And so here, how you prevent the producer from adding a new item to this bounded buffer is using this while loop, and it sits and spins. As long as it's going to write over, it just sits here, a tight loop, and does nothing. Just keeps looping, 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 looping. Then once you have space, in is not equal to out. Well, you store in that position, buffer in, that int position is that next produced item. So then you increment in, right? And you continue in this process. So on the consumer side, you're retrieving items from the buffer. And so you start out with your next item consumed, and then you have this tight loop. And as long as the input is equal to the output, i.e. you don't want to take from things that are just recently input. So you're going to do nothing. And so what this does is it prevents you from taking something beyond where you're inputting. right? Um, and so now, once you get past that, your next consume is buffer out. And so here it makes sure that it doesn't allow you to take an output if the place where you're inputting new items is also the place where you're outputting, because that's going to cause a contention, right? You can't input and output at the same time. And so then once you're not trying to take out from the same place where you're putting in uh, for position in this buffer, you're going to remove it. Next consumed is that particular position out in your buffer. So then you increment out, and you increment out. It's going to be plus one, but you'll notice again this modulo buffer size. So it's going to take it's taking out from the buffer. So here's my buffer, and it's going to take out and then increment and take out and increment and take out and increment and then wrap back around. That's what that module does and take out and increment, take out and increment and so forth. And so this is what the consumer does, and it does not allow you to take out if you're currently inputting. So if you're inputting here and your output increments and it wraps around, it doesn't allow you to say out and in are the same place. It doesn't allow you to do that. And say out is here and in is there as well. Okay. And so this is some pseudocode, as it were, uh, for the so-called bounded buffer consumer. And another version of IPC, we talked about shared memory, and shared memory itself is an actual area of memory that allows you to communicate between two processes. Now, this communication is under the control of the processes themselves and not the operating system. So the operating system does not intermediate or mediate between these two processes. They directly access shared memory as if they were accessing a piece of dynamically allocated memory. There's no operating system involved in this sharing. And so one of the major issues with this is that you need a mechanism that allows one process to synchronize or coordinate its actions with another process when they try to access shared memory. Because given this producer-consumer problem, someone may decide to write something to memory at the same time you're trying to read it. So all of a sudden, you have one value, and then that value changes right under your feet. And so synchronization provides mechanisms to have the controlled or coordinated access one at a time, so only one reader or one writer, but not both at the same time. You have this coordinated access one of, uh, at a time for uh, these pieces of shared memory. Another type of IPC is so-called message passing. And message passing allows your processes to communicate uh, and synchronize their action. This is done in a number of different ways, primarily through messaging systems. And so with a messaging system, processes communicate, but they don't resort to shared variables, no shared memory, no shared variables. And this is done through two abstractions, a send and receive message. And that message uh, semantic, how it's delivered, it can vary depending on the type of messaging system. But you notice here there's no idea of shared memory. 
right? And so the message size in this can either be fixed or variable. And let's assume you have two processes. We'll call them P and Q, and they wish to communicate. So the first thing they have to do is establish a communication link. And when they establish that link, that identifies them to the operating system. Well, these are the endpoints of this communication. So they establish a link, and then they exchange messages through these primitives for sending and receiving. Now, some of the issues are how do you establish these links? Can a link involve more than two processes? Is it process A communicating with process B, or is it process A communicating with processes B and C? How many links can there be between every pair of communicating processes? Can you have multiple channels of communication? What is the capacity of a link? At what rate can you send data through this communication link? Is the size of a message that we link, uh, that we use through the push through the link, uh, can this accommodate fixed or variable size data? And is it unidirectional or bidirectional? Unidirectional means it can go in only one direction, bidirectional. Data can go from A to B or B to A using this uh, message passing. And so how you implement the communication link, it can be physical, like shared memory or hardware bus or the network. It can also be logical. You can have direct communication. You can have indirect communication. You can have synchronous, meaning when you communicate, you block until that communication is, is resolved. Or asynchronous, you do not block. You automatically return and then know that it will be delivered at some point eventually. You can have automatic buffering or buffer it yourself explicitly. So with this direct communication process, they name each other explicitly through some sort of identifier or address. And so you issue a send P, identifying process P and the message. That means process P will get that message. It will be delivered to P. Likewise, a receive Q, well, that means you're going to receive a message specifically from process Q. So some properties of your communication link, links are established automatically. A link is associated with exactly one pair of processes that communicate. Between each pair, there's exactly one link, and the link may be either unidirectional, but in many cases, it's uh, bidirectional. For indirect communication, it's a little bit different. Indirect means that you don't have to be physically connected in order to get your messages. And so that means messages need to be stored at the endpoint of the communicating entities. And so with indirect communication, messages are directed and received from so-called mailboxes, often referred to as ports. And these mailboxes accumulate messages, and they have an address and a destination, and it ensures that the destination will receive this message, but the sender doesn't have to be continuously connected in order to send that message. And so processes can communicate in indirect communication only if they share a mailbox. So that means I have to deposit a message in the same mailbox or database or storage mechanism that you are going to receive a message from. So the communication link itself is established only if the processes share a mailbox. Because if you don't share a mailbox, you will never be able to send data to one another. A link may also be associated with many processes, and each pair of processes may share more than one communication link. So a link in this case is unidirectional or bidirectional. So when we look at operations for this kind of indirect communication, uh, we think about operations like creating a new mailbox, sending and receiving messages through the mailbox, destroying or tearing down a mailbox. And so the primitives are defined on these indirect communication mechanisms. You have a send and a receive method, uh, and you have the address of the mailbox, and you have the message in question. And so with indirect communication, let's assume we have mailbox sharing, and the neat part is that you can have more than one process. So let's say process one, two, and three, they share some mailbox, and we'll name that mailbox A. So process P1 sends and P2 and P3 receive. So sometimes this is called a publish and subscribe model. And so the question then is who gets this message? Now, one approach that people have taken is that you allow a link to be associated with at most two processes. So that means one send results in two things delivering. And you allow the system to select arbitrary to the receiver. So that means the sender is notified who the receiver was. You can kind of select things by name with the notion of an address. And so message passing 
may also be blocking or non-blocking. What blocking means is that it's synchronous. When you send the message, it's not until that send function returns, you have a resolution for the message pass and the calling process for that send system call, it does not continue until that system call has exited and control comes back to the calling process. That's blocking sense, blocking receive, you call receive, the receiver does not do anything until that IO request that receive is satisfied. Okay, so non-blocking or so-called asynchronous uh, communication, uh, the sender sends a message and then continues on, doesn't wait for the response. Now this means that the sender needs to be notified when a response does come back. And the non-blocking receive is similar, the receiver receives a valid message or a null message. If you receive a null message, that means no message was available and you just continue immediately. Now there are different possibilities or combinations of what I've just talked about. If both the sender and receiver are blocking, that's something called rendezvous. Now rendezvous means that you're both active in a send state or receive state and you're both blocking so that neither the sender or receiver process will continue to do anything until that send and receive has been resolved. And so producer, producer consumer becomes trivial when you have these messaging primitives. And so in the modified producer consumer, you get your next produced item, you sit in a tight while loop, and then you do a send next produce uh, inside of this loop. Now, if this send it uses a messaging channel or messaging system or is blocking, this becomes quite easy because the sending does not resume the program that calls send until the send call is has returned or exited. So then you get your next message, and this is for the consumer side. You do a receive, and if that receive is blocking, well, you don't get anything received until this receive call finishes, and the process that calls it, uh, it does not make any progress until this has been resolved. You also need to store messages because not all messages will actually fit. Uh, as the parameterization of your function. And these message bufferings or storage can be done in a number of different ways, three major flavors. With zero capacity, no messages are queued uh, in some link or some uh, box or some communication link. That means the sender has to wait for the receiver, i.e. rendezvous, and the sender transmits to the receiver one byte at a time, or one bit at a time, the message that's being sent. There's also bounded capacity. We have a finite length uh, or number of positions in your queue, and therefore only so many messages will fit, and then the sender has to wait if that buffer is full. Now that's a meet happy medium because you're bounding the resources, the memory resources you need in order to do a send, but once that buffer is full, you sent too many messages, you the sender start to block now next time you call send. Unbounded capacity means you have infinite length uh, buffers, and that means the sender never waits. And so this, theoretically, it's kind of not really doable, because if you think about it, even your hard drive, while well, hard drive has a lot of space, your hard drive has finite space. And so this unbounded capacity model is just that, a model, in that the sender never waits because the buffer never fills up. Okay, so with that, uh, we are going to end there with IPC and we'll pick back up on Tuesday with examples of IPC systems. Again, please make sure you're keeping up with the reading and we also have a project assignment due on the 29th of September. Uh, please make sure you are starting that early if you should have already started it and I look forward to seeing your solutions. So with that, as always, please stay healthy and stay safe and have a great weekend and I'll see you Tuesday.